Hello and welcome to Super Atheist Bros, Episode 5. We're back after a week off. I'm Turtle, along with Gavagai. Hello. And uh, today we are going to be talking about a couple of topics, including the new Planet of the Apes film. And uh, I think we're going to touch on, at least a little bit, on the, the previous Apes film as well. But uh, also we're going to be talking about the dangers of fundamentalism. And uh, we're going to start off by talking about uh, Ken Ham's recent activities. Yeah, so it's interesting. Um, the Huffington Post and maybe Salon.com, there were a few of them, uh, had reported about uh, creationist Ken Ham. This, the headline said, uh, creationist Ken Ham says aliens will go to hell, so let's stop looking for them. Um, and they they give various quotes um, and and talk about his blog. Um, let me see. I've got the the Huffington Post article here, and it says uh, he's calling for an end to the search for extraterrestrial life because aliens probably don't exist, and if they do, they're going to hell anyway. Um, and then they give quotes from the actual blog, and it says, "You see, the Bible makes it clear that Adam's sin affected the whole universe." It uh, goes on and says, this means that any aliens would also be affected by Adam's sin, but because they are not descendants, uh, Adam's descendants, they can't have salvation. Um, <laughs> which is very sad for any aliens, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> down down below, they've they've got an image of Worf from Star Trek looking sad, and they say, <laughs> sorry, Worf. <laughs> so, but... Uh, and and Ham, I, I I took a look at his um, his blog, and there's nothing there that he says um, that I I think that they misrepresent, um, and everything that they've said he says um, is there to my knowledge. But he he actually posts a, a response. Uh, complaining, he says, well, since secularists and some media outlets have been falsely accusing me of say, uh, saying space aliens are going to hell as a result of this post, please meet, write, read my response here. And his his response um, basically just says, you know, they're slanted and they're... Uh, their headlines were intended to grab attention. Well, of course they are. I mean, headlines do that. And but I, I don't think that they were inaccurate. And then he he goes on, um, and then it basically reposts his entire pro post. And he says, "Well, now here's here's what I actually said." But he doesn't point out anything that that he thinks they particularly got wrong. And he also doesn't say, well, and here's the text that they used, and here it is in context, and this is why it's wrong. He doesn't do anything like that. Um, most of what he does is to go on and say uh, a lot of what is written in Huffington Post is really fiction. So he's just, he's, um, it's basically an ad hominem against the Huffington Post. Uh, and he says, in, uh, including some items that Huffington Post has written about answers in Genesis, Genesis and the Creation Museum, as many of you already know. Um, yeah. <laughs> so he, he doesn't really, he's attacking them, but doesn't provide any substance. Um, and the other thing that I think is, is interesting is by saying, he, he says in his article, okay, maybe we'd find plant life um, or some lower forms of animal life and things like that, um, which uh, he 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 thinks is probably not true um, by reading the Bible. But he's he's saying, okay, well, I guess it's possible that we could find that. Um, but he says we wouldn't find any intelligent life there, um, and the the Bible predicts this. The, the interesting thing to me is this, is this is a falsifiable and testable claim so that if we do come in contact with intelligent life, his claim f based on the Bible would be falsified. Um, now, we've seen other predictions and things like that cast from the biblical text in the past that 
um, have been falsified, and people don't drop their belief, of course. They modify right. and, and revise their beliefs uh, to say, or oh, they of course. interpret the data in their own, own way. Yeah, that's true, too. Yeah, so, but, but they don't change their beliefs fundamentally, so, uh, but at least it's, to me, it's something, and it's, it's the, probably the closest, you know, one of the, the points from the Ken Ham and Bill Nye debates um, that was, was most interesting, and it's very uh, often cited is the, this question at the end where they said, well, what, you know, what would it take to disprove your beliefs or for you to change your beliefs and ham, hims, and haws, uh, and the result is nothing would change his belief, uh, no evidence to the contrary, um, whereas uh, Bill Nye said evidence would, would change my beliefs and, and I would change, and, and it, you know, here are ways that theoretically the uh, theory of evolution could be disproved, and all you would have to do is find X, Y, and Z. Uh, and that would be fundamentally problematic for the theory of evolution, and you know we would have to abandon it and say, well, how do we explain things now? So, yeah, anyhow. there's there's this this uh, common thought process amongst especially religious people who are in the in the limelight, where admitting or being willing to say that you would change your views is is a weakness for them, and uh, it's it's interesting. I there's a documentary on HBO um, called Questioning Darwin, and I wasn't sure about what where it was going or what its point was, and I was a bit skeptical of it. And I'm not I'm not after having watched it, I'm not entirely sure what they were trying to go for, but they basically had a handful of Christians, and I believe Ken Ham was, I'm pretty sure he was one of the Christians that they had on there, but also just kind of some some pastors and um, uh, average citizens as well, and then they had some scientists on there talking about Darwin, and so you get these kind of contrasting views on Darwin, but what I thought was the most amusing part of the documentary is at one point this pastor s says something to the effect of if the Bible said that 2 plus 2 equals 5 he would believe that and then work with that information going forward rather than doubt the Bible which I, th I thought was a very uh, honest and intriguing <laughs> way to look at the Bible yeah, what do you do with that? <laughs> you just want to shake your head and go, "Really? <laughs> That's and, what you would do?" And he's, you know, he's, you know, putting that out there as though that's a positive. You know, that's he's proud of this fact. It's like, okay. Yeah. So, and I think I don't know if you if you have anything more to say about. Uh, Ham's article here, but I think this makes a good transition into uh, our next topic, uh, which is uh, the dangers of, of fundamentalist belief uh, and and violence uh, in particular. Um, yeah, so let's go I ahead. Guess, yeah, so uh, I, I wanted to look up first of all a definition of fundamentalism, um, and this is just kind of the the Google definition that pops up first. It says a form of religion, especially, this is a definition of fundamentalism, um, especially of Islam or Protestant Christianity that holds belief in the strict literal interpretation of Scripture. Um, and, you know, when I, when I had first uh, thought about trying to put this uh, together, uh, I had planned on kind of using this narrative from uh, the founding of, of the nation of Israel. But as I kind of was preparing for this, um, I, I looked into it, and there was a lot more to the founding of the nation, the modern nation of Israel than, uh, than I had been aware of as far as nuance and, and a whole lot of different just kind of political things. And it wasn't um, uh, Jewish people marching in with guns and things. Um, 
it, it was odd. But so that that didn't fit into my narrative. But there's still uh, there, there there are uh, fundamentalist Jewish people, um, and and there were Zionists who were willing and and um, took a, took it upon themselves to use violence um, in order to accomplish their their goals and things politically and um, as far as establishing a state and so that that was there uh, it wasn't necessarily the the central kind of thrust or or means by which they formed their state of Israel um, but we we definitely see um, violence related to uh, fundamentalist uh, Islam and in the Middle East we see kind of the clash between these two um, kind of primary religions of, of Islam uh, fundamentalist Judaism and even uh, probably as much or more the the different sects uh, the Sunni and uh, yeah. Shiites and what's Shiites, yes, uh, both of which are fundamentalist, and and it's, it's based on nothing more than who should succeed the Prophet Muhammad or whatever, uh, and I mean that's their their big uh, difference between the two groups, but but because both are committed 100% uh, unyieldingly to that that doctrine. Uh, they they refuse and, and are willing to use violence and and because they hold that as absolute truth um, and 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 uh, you know just like you were just saying um, you know this dogma becomes so rigid that uh, anything that counters it or contradicts it uh, becomes a threat um, and so at, at any rate, um, there's there's also uh, Christians uh, who have resorted to violence. Uh, there's a website called uh, Religious Tolerance. Uh, Ontario Consultants on Religious Tolerance is uh, it's religioustolerance.org, uh, but they have a, a page specifically related to uh, Christianity and. Um, and they cite several groups that have have taken terrorist uh, actions in the U.S. and and in other countries as well. Um, the Oklahoma City bombing was in part motivated by religious views. Uh, there have been uh, attacks on abortion clinics and and shootings of abortion providers, uh, poisoning of muni or attempted poisoning of municipal water supplies and things like that, uh, in the name of religion and uh, you know another another thing that kind of gets twisted into this is is nationalistic uh, ideologies and things too. Mm -hmm. um, then the the last thing that I kind of wanted to touch on was was whether or not um, that kind of motivation and and ideology uh, has any potential of creeping into um, atheist uh, movements and things. And um, you know, a lot of times Christians will point to these atheist regimes um, in the Soviet Union uh, and and Asia. communist China and things, right? And and they'll say, well, look, here are the results of atheism. Um, but I think just like you know, nationalists or or Christian groups, or you know, they they would say in a lot of cases, nominally Christian groups that that are Christians in name only, um, that support racism and things. Um, those groups get these other ideologies in, entangled with their beliefs, and I think that's what has ha or what did happen with these atheist regimes, that they they got these other uh, ideologies tangled up, and and their disbelief in God wasn't really what motivated them to, uh, you know, take take action and and you know eliminating people and, and things like that. Um, yeah, and I mean, in, 
in a number of cases, you have kind of instead of a god that they worship, it's the state, you know. Yes. That they they hold up on high, and no one can question the state in in a lot of those situations. And it isn't just because someone is an atheist doesn't mean they're also a skeptic. And you have I forget which uh, uh, country it was or whatever, but uh, you had like uh, in the, uh, the dictator in that in the one country was um, having people who wore glasses executed or whatever just because because people who wore glasses were uh, intellectuals or something like that and they posed a threat to him in some way. Um, but you have but it, you point being just because you 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 don't have this one superstition doesn't mean you don't have other superstitions that can be equally as dangerous. Right. I mean, yeah, the, and so, the moral the moral of the story is, is to be as as skeptical as possible about all all these superstitions. But absolutely, absolutely, and and the other the other thing to kind of be wary of uh, is the the stark division I think between us and other. Um, and as you begin to do that and, and you say, well, we're atheists and those people over there aren't as smart as us or aren't something, you know, yeah. uh, they're deficient in some way. Uh, that becomes, a, a, I think, at least the, the start of a problem. And um, just like with, with any other prejudice and... Um, hate-based motivated violence and things like that. And, and it worries me some when I see uh, atheists responding to creationist videos and things and calling them creatards and what have you. You know, that's not a, that's not a rationally based uh, response. It is an emotive response. It is uh, ad hominem. Um, and it's it's not healthy, and I think we should be wary of of that. Be aware of it, and and also do what we can to try and discourage it as a as a community of of people who are trying to have positive influence and effect on on the world and create you know more rational uh, society and culture. Yeah, um, that actually kind of. Uh leads into something I, I was thinking about while you were talking about, you know, like the the radical Islamists and um, uh, the the Jews who, who are uh, more fundamentalist and, and get into violence and whatever. And you know, there you know, there are some groups of Christians who who are are okay with with violence and, and use that. But I mean by and large you know, here in in the U.S., ninety nine point nine percent of the the Christians here are passive, and at least in terms of their interactions with um, other people, um, maybe not so much in terms of their foreign policy. But uh, what what I th I think as I was thinking about this as you were talking about, I think it has more more than anything to do with just your your peers your um, in in if you go into a Muslim nation because there's this kind of this group think where all these people kind of have this this idea of this is important this is how we deal with it therefore it's okay to behave in this way whereas here in the United States and you know, most other, you know, like European countries that that have um, these Christian groups, they they don't have that that threat so much as as uh, with where you have that kind of head-on conflict between the Shiites and Sunnis and and uh, in Palestine and whatnot. But uh, but because there there's this this kind of societal uh, mellowness I guess um, it's easy to look at those other groups that behave behave that way and and scratch your head and say oh, I'll see how much better we are than them um, but it to me it's it it has 
little to do with their their underlying um, belief system and more to do with their surroundings um, much in the same way that um, people who are born in the United States tend to be Christian people who are born in India tend to be Hindu it's it has more to do with just your societal surroundings than your actual beliefs and um, to get to uh, you're talking about like the atheists um, some of the atheists on on YouTube in particular uh, because atheists tend to be the ones who care the most about these religious topics on YouTube you have this large force at the moment of atheists all kind of you know even you go to some of these Christian um, apologist uh, video pages and there's all these thumbs downs and and all this stuff um, be just because there there's so many atheists at this point and that's their their uh, YouTube is is kind of the, the place where they congregate so you have this kind of overwhelming um, atheist uh, group at this point in time dealing with these the the subject of religion and so it kind of creates uh, this almost bully uh, atmosphere or can create a bully atmosphere at this point in time and I think you're right that we need to be careful of that and just because at the moment we're the dominant group um, dealing with the subject uh, on in this forum um, doesn't mean we should um, become bullies right exactly yeah yeah, the, the, what we do have going for us is that we don't have a, a text or a divine religious authority or, or you know, quote-unquote divinely appointed religious authority from whom we get um, our, our message. And I think, you know, one of the problems with Judaism, Christianity, and Islam is that all three of them have texts with both some passages that talk about peace and kindness and those kinds of things, but mixed in are other passages where it does advocate for violence in certain situations and things. And whatever that text as the sole source for truth and morality, um, they can pick and choose then when they want to apply one or the other, so that becomes problematic. And yeah, we, uh, I mean it um, is as a as a. Go ahead. I was just gonna say you have these um, these texts that you know it's some some of it I'm sure is got some history and mixed in there you know but as, at least in terms of like oh this group fought this group and the group that won views that win in you know this historical battle against another group as being uh, that, you know ordained by God and so you have this kind of built in just because we were the group that won we believe in this God therefore that God said this battle was just and whatever so you have kind of this um, religious uh, interpretation of just some historical event and then over time that turns into you know a justification for a different conflict you know well um, Yahweh approves of of this uh, tactic and this this you know fight that we we fought in the past so therefore he does in the future and in the present as well and so we're justified in in uh, whatever we do basically is in terms of violence Yes, which is a, a very scary phenomenon that <laughs> uh, can can lead to all, all sorts of uh, bad repercussions when you, in your own mind, and this is, what, I think, what happened, although not um, not due to, you know, uh, like a deity's, uh, you know, or the... Uh, alleged uh, blessing of a deity on on the leadership or what have you, but with uh, with regard to the the communist regimes and things like that 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 decided well 
everything that we do is right and we know we know best so it's uh, I guess another aspect of it is the kind of an uh, humility uh, with regard to your own epistemology and, and what you think you have the capacity to know and when you become you know in your mind um, bulletproof with regard to your own knowledge and and wisdom then uh, you know, you feel justified in rolling over anybody else who disagrees with you. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. Um, do you have anything more you want to say on that subject, or you want to move on? No, I think yeah. Let's let's shift over to Planet of the Apes. All right, so um, we are going to get into. It's pretty much unavoidable to to have this discussion without getting into major spoilers for this uh, new movie, Dawn of the Planet of the Apes. So if you haven't seen Dawn of the Planet of the Apes, um, I think we both can recommend going and seeing it. It's an enjoyable film. I don't, You don't necessarily have to see the previous one, but it definitely helps. Um, but yeah, so we're going to get into this. If you, if you haven't seen it and you don't want to be spoiled, you might want to stop listening to this and come back to it later. But uh, yeah, I I enjoyed it quite a bit. There was a couple things. If I was doing it, I think I would have done a little bit differently. But uh, what are your overall your overall impression of the new movie? Um, I really enjoyed it. Um, did now I haven't read any of the books. Does do either of the first two me- movies here that, that have been recently made reflect anything from the the, the books? Well, I I'm not to your knowledge. I, my understanding is that the original film with Charlton Heston was based on a novella. I don't think I could be wrong. I, I didn't think it was like a series of books. Um, I thought okay. it was just one one book. And um, this is, I think most of this, the Plan of the Apes stuff comes just from the the original films. I don't think this follows um, because I, I I could be wrong again, but the the plot of the first movie with Charlton Heston is similar to the plot of the book in that there it it's about an astronaut who lands on this planet um, as opposed to kind of like the emergence of the apes on on the planet um, <laughs> spoiler spoiler alert for anyone who hasn't seen the Charlton Heston film I guess right He's I uh, on this planet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was thinking about that the other day. It, it is like I enjoy I enjoy the original uh, movie f- uh, franchise. Um, it's it's dated a bit, but it is like that first movie is probably the second most spoiled ending out of any movie ever. The only one I would put ahead of that is Empire Strikes Back. Spoilers for that movie, but uh, learning that Darth Vader is Luke's father. I can't imagine there's anybody who doesn't know that uh, Darth Vader is Luke's father at this point in time, or very few people who don't know that Planet of the Apes is actually Earth, especially with these new movies out where it is very obviously Earth, and that's not even a a question. Um, but but yeah, so these don't these don't follow the the way that the original movies went and as far as I know don't follow the book either um, like I said I don't think the book deals with how the apes uh, took over the planet I could be wrong about that though um, but uh, yeah I, I really I did I also enjoyed it I enjoyed this one more than um, rise of the planet of the apes I do think it's a bit odd the titles of those two movies, you would think they would be reversed, that the first one would have been Dawn of the Planet of the Apes and the new one would have been Rise of the Planet of the Apes, but um, it's it's the opposite for some reason. But, um, yeah, so um, I, I very much enjoyed the uh, villain of this movie, Koba. Um, I thought he was a great villain. I also really, the one thing I think they nailed in this movie was just tension. Throughout the movie there's just these tense moments that um, really made the movie enjoyable for me. Um, 
like right right off the bat you have that scene where um the the human wanders into the apes territory there and uh there's the the two young apes and um he, he pulls out the gun and ends up shooting one of the one of the apes and and his group catches up with him and then they're just completely surrounded by all these apes with spears and then caesar just yells go what a, what a terrifying moment that was if you were <laughs> if you were a human just surrounded by all these apes and then one of them just yells at you to go i, I thought that was really yeah. really good yeah, well, and apparently the humans at, at that point had not really had any kind of contact with the apes uh, that had begun to build a civilization. So they're, they didn't realize even that the apes were capable of saying the word go yeah. uh, like that. So to have them surround them... Uh, you know, and and be threatening with weapons that they've crafted. Apparently, wearing you know some clothing and and makeup and things like that, or not makeup like war paint. Uh, they had war paint. Yeah, yeah, that's a bit. <laughs> wearing lips, <laughs> some lipstick and like eyeliner. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, yeah, so the whole the whole encounter was you know complete shock, I think. And then just to top that off was this this uh, revelation, my God, they have language. <laughs> yeah. So. Um. The uh. So, this um this. The the two the two new movies this for this reboot actually kind of correspond more with the last two movies of the original uh, series where because the as I mentioned the the very the Charlton Heston one takes place in the distant future and he lands on the planet and it's overrun by the apes and the apes are in complete control at that point and there's there's humans off in the jungles but they don't speak and they're they're basically like wild animals that wear clothes um and um where whereas the the final two films of that franchise uh, the fourth one dealt with um kind of the uprising of of the uh, apes which more or less co corresponds to um Rise of the Planet of the Apes the movie from a couple years ago and then um, the fifth film was uh, of the original franchise was Battle for the Planet of the Apes, which sort of I haven't actually seen that one in quite a long time, but I would say kind of more corresponds to this one, where it's kind of like the surviving humans take on the uh, the rising uh, ape movement. Um, one thing I I was actually kind of opposed to the um, the new Apes franchise one when, when I saw a preview for it however many years ago it was before that first one came out where I saw a preview for it. For one thing I, I just I thought it didn't make any sense in the context of like the modern civilization where it just seemed um, unbelievable to me that somehow apes would overrun humans given all the advantages that humans have, but I I do think they came up with a clever way of dealing with that, which is you have this disease that um, wipes out the vast majority of humanity, and uh, that that yeah, pandemic, and then uh, go ahead. No, you go ahead. Well, I was just gonna say the the uh, it was basically like a twofold thing, right? That the there was this pandemic that was spread with this disease. Um, what did they call it? Simian something that oh, you simian know, flu. The, yeah, yeah. And then and then on, on the other hand, it was research related to um, Alzheimer's that was being done on these apes that gave them somehow you know this neurological capacity basically to have advanced thinking and, and cognitive capacity, which, you know, is probably a stretch because you you would need, uh, I guess, brain structures that uh, accommodate that and just, 
you know, drinking a potion <laughs> basically does not doesn't quite get you to you know the uh, functionality of a prefrontal cortex and things that that uh, modern Homo sapiens have, but it was sciencey and it's science fiction, so you know it doesn't all have to make a whole lot yeah. of perfect sense or yeah, plausible. I, it's just it's plausible enough. <laughs> yeah, I I agree. Uh, like, cause one of the the thoughts that I had watching the first one is even if you uh, gave the apes, you know, this this potion or whatever, it's it's still a stretch to have them comprehend these things like you have in the first one. I actually just watched the first one like the week before I went to see the new one. Um, but uh, you have like Koba in the first film. He's, he's, all, he's writing Jacob's name who is kind of the more or less the villain of the first movie. Um, he He's able to write his name, which is it's like that's a complicated thing, you know? <laughs> Like to to understand the letters and and all that, it's like that's even if you have the ability to to do like I you know I have the ability to speak Japanese, but I don't know how to do it. <laughs> you know, like we can all we all have the ability to do things, but we don't have the the skills to do it. We don't have the knowledge how how to do these things. You know, I could fly a plane, but I don't know how to do it. You know. Um, or you know, play play a game that I've never played before. Yeah, I could do it, but I don't. I'm not just because I drink a potion doesn't mean I suddenly know how to do it. Um, but but it's one of those things where, like you said, you kind of just uh, suspension allow. of belief, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, but um, with with the new film, you kind of get past that. Um, I mean, I think the trickiest thing with the new film is in the first film you have you have Caesar and you have um, the apes that are with him at the uh, ape sanctuary, uh, and all of those apes get get the get the potion. They get the uh, what I forget what the the chemical or or the virus is that they're they're given that actually enhances their intelligence. But then you and then you have the apes that are that are still at the research facility with Koba, and so you have these basically two groups of apes that all get this thing, and then they go and release some apes from the zoo. But none of those apes have have this um, knowledge. Serum. Yeah, they don't have the the serum to en enhance their intelligence. So it's a a bit of a stretch that you would have that many apes by the time 10 years later. And granted, they did say that um, it can be p passed down genetically. That's how Caesar has it. He got it uh, genetically from his mom. Um, but uh, so they have that built in, but it still is it's a bit of a stretch to say 10 years later you have this massive army of, of apes that are all super intelligent. But again, it's kind of one of those suspension of uh, disbelief. So, um, now, in the new film, uh, I thought, and this is kind of gets into something I enjoyed, but then I also, if I was doing the film, I think I would have done it differently. But uh, when they, uh, Koba, who is is the villain of the new film, and uh, at one point, and again, major spoilers here, but uh, Koba basically assass or attempts to assassinate um, Caesar, and I thought I thought that was a very interesting idea. If it were me, I would have actually had him kill Caesar and Caesar actually stay dead. Um, but um, I thought that was a a very surprising moment because I think they did a good job with Koba of making him, especially in the beginning, making him. A villain, but making you able to kind of see his point of view, um, where he sees, he, given his experiences with humans, he he sees humans as uh, a threat, and you can't trust anything that they say. Um, and so, even I can I can understand from his point of view, as Caesar is is trusting these humans, that he's losing trust in Caesar, and Caesar maybe isn't uh, the leader that 
that they need to get out of this uh, to to deal with the humans. Um, to the point where then he he betrayed and not not that I'm saying um, I agree with it, but I at least I can understand Koba's reasoning uh, for that. Um, yeah, the that, character is the character is believable. Yeah. Um, he gets they, they take in my opinion they maybe take it too far because then they have after after basically his overthrow of Caesar, like he kind of goes full on villain. Um, where he then he's like killing other apes who disagree with him or um, don't obey his orders um, to the point where I okay may, I could see it from the standpoint of you know his power goes to his head um, but I if uh, if I were doing the film I would have because there's at, at that one at one point one of the younger apes um, refuses to kill a human. And he says basically because Caesar Caesar wouldn't have wanted it, so he doesn't kill a human. And so then Koba takes that ape and then kills him, and basically just says, um, you know, Caesar Caesar is gone. I'm in charge now. And I I was thinking about it, and if I were the one making the the film, I think rather than have him say that because that makes him just basically a pure villain tyrant at that point, I would have put it in the context of like. This is how serious this is. These people are this. Humans are this dangerous that we can't have any kind of weakness. Uh, that's that was that would be my justifi justification for having Koba kill that other ape. But I guess that's a matter of personal preference. But um, I'm not sure if they intended to do it or not. But what I f find interesting is because they do have Caesar Caesar gets shot and is presumed dead they find the humans find Caesar and um, they take him to his old house and they kind of uh, perform surgery on him there and get get the bullet out and um, I'm not sure what the timeline is exactly I know that during the night before um, his ally apes come to get him. Um, I'm blanking on the human's name, but uh, the man who's his, basically his ally, the, the good guy, um, uh, says to Caesar, it's been two days, um, meaning since, um, since all, all the uh, chaos went down, so since Caesar had been shot. So then I'm curious if then... It's meant to be that on the third, because the big battle between Koba and Caesar takes place on the third, the third day after that. I would assume um, in the in the morning of the third day, if that is an intentional um, Jesus parallel, or if that's a coincidence, um, because you have this this figure dying and then coming back on the third day. And um, obviously, a clear parallel to Jesus and Judas's battle, you know, that they had in the Bible. Um, <laughs> but uh, okay, maybe not. But uh, um, but I do wonder if that was because Caesar does seem to become, you know, this messiah-like figure at that end end of the film, where they're all uh, bowing down and. Uh, Raising their hand in uh, what's the word I'm looking for um, submission I guess to to uh, Caesar. So, and in the original Planet of the Apes movies, at least in the last one, I'm pretty sure like it because that one takes place uh, after the original Caesar had had been dead. Um, that that Caesar had been, I think he's called the Lawgiver or something like that. Or if I remember correctly, there's the the film takes place. Uh, it, the way the film works is you have like this old figure telling these young children apes about this battle. So it, the actual story is about Caesar, but it's being told um, like a story to these children. So you have this kind of further on down the line perspective, and he's um, 
be, become kind of this um, religious figure uh, um, to an extent. But uh, so I uh, I wonder if there was an, an intent to to have this kind of um, religious uh, parallel there, or if that's a coincidence. Yeah, I would think that it's, it's probably intentional. Uh, you know, the the original Planet of the Apes definitely has some essence of, of religious teaching that is underpinning their culture and things. Um, I know they, they talk about, you know, the creator making all apes equal and... Yeah. Um, you know, they're, they're, it's definitely there, and so it makes sense that, you know, there would be some kind of building toward that uh, uh, phenomenon in these movies to to give that uh, culture, of, the religious culture, some footing to to take hold of. Yeah, I was telling my, uh, my friend that... Uh, I don't. I don't. I wonder if if they they are intending to to go forward with some kind of you know Caesar as a messiah type figure. I can understand that, but I was saying if I were if I were the one making the film, I would have had Koba be the. You know, I would have had uh, Caesar be dead and then Koba being on top at the end. Because I mean the 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 gist of the, these films is about you know the rise of these apes and Koba definitely um, is a character that would want the apes to take over, whereas Caesar's intent intentions are are definitely more uh, peaceful than Koba's were. So, but I wonder if if that would have just been too dark. You know, may, I wonder if at some point Koba during in the scripting process Koba was. Um, the uh, victor and leading the apes into kind of this uh, conflict. I mean, they've set up that basically there there is going to be this conflict because they have this incoming army and Caesar's basically uh, at the end of this film, you know, saying that uh, it's unavoidable at this point. So ape, apes started this war and the humans won't forgive. So. He's basically relenting and saying we will, we will fight. But um, I wonder if at at some point in the scripting process, uh, Caesar was just dead and Koba uh, was was in control. Because I, I would have thought that the in an interesting storyline for the third one would have been somehow um, Blue Eyes, who is Caesar's son, finding out that Koba was the one who assassinated Caesar. And then having this conflict arise between Koba and, and uh, Blue Eyes, but uh, I'm also a little skeptical about whether or not Koba is actually dead. Um, just because yeah, I was wondering. I, I I was just thinking, trying to remember exactly how they brought that to a conclusion, and I, I don't remember exactly, but it wasn't he impaled by something. Koba? No, Koba. Koba falls. Um, right. He. And that's why it's questionable to me, is because okay. he, he he fall like in real life. If anything fell, the amount of uh, the, from the from height, the height that, that he falls right. that he falls, it would be dead. But given that it's a movie, and because his <laughs> as he as he's falling, his fall gets broken a couple of times. Like he's he falls a little ways, and then like he his leg gets caught on a wire, so he gets his. Uh, Momentum gets changed, and then he hits another wire, and he gets changed again, and then he hits kind of this platform that's just kind of hanging in the balance precariously, and then the whole platform falls into a mist, and then you don't see him fall anymore, and then you don't see him again. Okay. So I suspect. So it's definitely less definitive than being impaled on something or whatever. So. Yeah, less less definitive than that. I I suspect that Koba, which it's one of those things where I enjoy Koba so much I, I wouldn't mind seeing him again, but at the same time it's one of those things where, much like with, in my opinion, Caesar, like I, I just feel like if you kill off a character, you should keep him keep him dead. But, <laughs> um, 
We'll we'll see. I I'm interested too because in the first uh, of those films, you have uh, allusions to uh, a, this this uh, spaceship headed to Mars, and then it gets lost apparently, and it's it's just briefly um, brought to your attention, and then um, it's left left open ended. Um, but you just have like, oh, there's this going to be the first man mission to Mars and then you see this headline in, in a newspaper that says lost in space and uh, and then that's that as far as I'm aware that's the only two things um, but I'm assuming that and I wasn't sure because there are a handful of just um, pretty straightforward references to the original films like at one point Caesar is um, putting together one of those three-dimensional puzzles, and it's uh, a, the puzzle is the Statue of Liberty, and then the most obvious one is um, the one of his handlers when he's at the um, sanctuary. Uh, his handler says, "Get get your damn hands off, or get your hands off me, you damn dirty ape," you know, which is clear, <laughs> in my opinion, a little too obvious uh, reference to uh, <laughs> Charlton Heston's line and. The original films, but uh, but yeah. So I, I wasn't sure when I s saw that that first movie if those were just kind of like little winks at the audience, or if that was like they're actually intending to set up that. I mean, the tricky thing would be if if the let's say the next film is deals with the astronaut returning, is you don't have that twist you can go to at the end because everybody knows it's Earth. Um, but um, it would will be interesting to see if that is the. I assume they're going to do another one. Well, and I th there, go ahead. Yeah, there there would have to be a lot more change with um, the the status of human beings on the on the planet because when in the original films. There were human beings, but none of them could speak. They'd lost the ability to speak, and they had, in in essence, you know, become much like the the apes that that we have today, and living yeah. in small uh, bands, basically. So something's got to kind of bring that about, that change in in uh, the human. Um, Line so that they they lose the ability to to speak and communicate and have higher level thinking. So uh, I, I can't imagine that yeah, they well, are going to bring the astronaut back before that happens because that would be in contradiction to the original. Well, it depends on how close they want to stick to the original. At which I I because th I think the problem with trying to to stick with the original is the what makes the original so interesting is that twist at the end um, of oh oh my god this this place is Earth you know this isn't just a bunch of apes on some mm -hmm. foreign planet this is this is the place I knew and it's destroyed so you you can't go with that twist because your f first two films have already made it clear um, what where you are but. You know, so I don't know, and, and whether or not they take place um, in the in the I I see I I feel like just because of the way that movie movie studios work, odds are is that the next film is going to uh, take place pr pretty quickly, meaning having the same cast of characters. You know, in terms of the apes, like they want to stick. You know, Caesar's a popular character. And if Colba's alive, you know, he's a popular character, they're going to want to stick rather than jumping into the future uh, several decades and starting with a whole new cast of characters. Um, I just, I suspect that we're going to be, uh, that they're not going to be ballsy enough to, to do that and kind of start with a, a clean slate um, of characters. Um which is okay if they come up with a good story, you know. But sure, my my fear is that if they do stick with kind of the current uh, 
cast of characters and timeline um, rather than jumping ahead is that the next movie is going to be too similar to this one. Um, one thing I liked about this movie is how different it was from the last one, you know, because the last one was just basically modern society and then the story of, you know, this one ape in particular, um, whereas this is completely different setting and um, different circumstances. And that, that's one thing I really liked about the original uh, movie franchise was, with the exception of the second movie, basically all those movies are very different from each other. Um, which is something you don't get a lot of in uh, movie franchises, um, where there's just you a lot of time, you know, like something like Indiana Jones, where it's, it's yeah, he's going after a different thing, but it's still kind of that same storyline of Indiana Jones hunting down something. Whereas with the Planet of the Apes movies, like I said, with the exception of the second one, which is more or less a repeat of the first one with a little different ending. Um, they all have very different storylines. But, uh, yeah, I, I really enjoyed it. Um, I'm looking forward to seeing what they do with, with the franchise in the future. I agree, yeah. And I like you said at the beginning, I enjoyed the first one, but uh, it, it was a very... Uh, a pleasant surprise to see a sequel that uh, I think far outdid the first one even and you know the, the I, I really really enjoyed the the second one um, you know and, and thought that it it took the storyline in, in an interesting and, and very different direction uh, from the first one or you know advanced it uh, in, a, in a very good direction so I'm, I'm looking forward to the third as well um. All right. Well, I think that about covers everything we wanted to cover today. Um, I, you, uh, I don't think uh, I have anything going on next weekend, so I think we'll, unless you got something on going on, we'll be back again. Nope. We're, re we're ready to rock and roll again. Uh, good to be back from a uh, little little leave here, but. Um, yeah, this is a lot of fun. I'm uh, I'm very glad that we uh, that you suggested to do this. It's been it's been a pleasure, and I I think uh, we've got a number of viewers and subscribers now that um, you know seem to be giving positive in uh, feedback. So uh, definitely want to keep it up. Um, I think we're gonna try and talk about a documentary called Searching for Sugar Man next week. Uh, if you our listener of this and you haven't seen that documentary, I recommend checking that out before we talk about it. Um, because it's unlike most documentaries, you kind of want to, you don't want to be spoiled about the contents of, of the, the documentary just because of the way it's, pre the information is presented, I think is very interesting. But um, yeah, so uh, until next time, Super Atheist Bros out. See ya.